Welcome to the second part of The Death of Pelican 16. Originally the film was made in two finished lengths, 54 minutes for broadcast television and 90 minutes for DVD. This version on YouTube in two parts is the 90 minute, the full length version. We sold exactly 1,200 DVDs. Most were sold in South Africa, probably a hundred of those were sold in the UK. And the South African Air Force Museum got a percentage, I don't remember what it was at this point, of all of those sales. The program was also bought by Discovery Channel, Discovery Wings as it was then known, bought the program, did a major re-edit and it was broadcast in the UK. We did get amount of money for, from them, it was very little considering how much Discovery pay for their own programs, but we did get some of that money and that went partly to financing uh, my own expenses in that for that project but I didn't do it for money and it didn't make money I did it for love and the part two is for me the best part of the whole story and when we got to 50 feet and we just shot to everybody brace it goes through the replay. It's, it's a drill. Brace, 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 brace. And then at 20 feet, we yank the tiles. And it just held it. We hit the deck. Grinding, grating noise, just, and the engines just coming to a sudden silence. And then that grating noise. I remember the aircraft slewing to the right and then lifting up from the left. And as it was getting higher and higher, I thought, uh oh, are we gonna start cartwheeling? And the stuff fell on top of us. It was one hell of an impact. I mean, it's a 500 foot minute radio descent. Quite a... Otherwise, I'll imagine for crash landing, it was quite smooth. The noise, unbelievable. I was holding this punctually right here with my left hand like this. And I sort of went right out of my straps like this. It was unbelievable. Forty, who was sitting in the, uh, in the galley area of the Shackleton, a beacon, a personal locator beacon, fell on his head and cut his head open. And then came these severe, uh, uh, veering to the, to the left by 90 degrees, and then we ended off uh, by skidding sideways. Now, when you come to a standstill, the pilot in command gives the command dinghies out, which means you get out of that aeroplane. I think Eric was speaking to himself. We were already out of the aeroplane. And I don't know if you, you sometimes get these little houses in, in, a, in a glass thing and you shake them with the snow and you watch the snow settle. That's what is, the dust started settling. And suddenly, out of this dust, popped his head. It was Eric. He said to me, get out, because I'm the first one. I've got to go out the top here. Coppola leaves first. And I, I couldn't get my straps undone. But eventually I got them undone and then the smell of avgas, I mean, was unbelievable. And I thought, geez, you know, if somebody, if there's a spark or something, this lot's gonna go up. We've done all this hard work to put the airplane on the ground. Please don't let us burn now, you know what I mean? <laughs> anyway, so eventually um, I got out and I was standing on the top and uh, I didn't know where the wing was. I opened the escape patch onto the starboard wing and I actually helped the people uh, that was in the nav compartment and radar compartment to actually go out by the emergency hatch and off the wing I actually helped them there. Mr. Balladin was the nearest guy to the back door. He broke the handle off so the door couldn't be open. And we also had problems with the top hatch. We couldn't get the top hatch open. But we decided, this is it, the hatch is there, that small portal there, and that's where we jumped out. Some of the guys had torches. I didn't have a torch. Some of them had torches. And they were putting the torch under their faces like this, and they were going, 
Hallo! <laughs> Hallo! <laughs> you can't believe it. Anyway, I saw them and they were all sort of congregating in a place behind the airplane. I asked everyone to hold hands and asked John Balladin to do a head count. And I remember John looking and he said, all 19's here. I just said in a very subdued voice, is there anyone that wants to say anything? Knowing full well that someone was going to either just say thank God or break into some kind of prayer and it happened. Tony Adonis was our paymaster, initiated our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so we finished it. And that has been a ritual that we've done ever since the 13th of July, 1994. Whenever we've got together each year on the anniversary of our accident, we have come together and said our prayer. But there were millions of stars. And it was that oppressive quiet. I, re I remember the lads were, were laughing quite a bit, but I don't know whether it was to mask their their anxiety whether it was a it almost as if they were lightheaded as if they were um had had been on some other alcoholic refreshment they were just quite relaxed about it there was almost like a macho blaseness about what had what had happened so we waited probably about half an hour and we sent the engineers back into the airplanes and they started bringing all the baggage out and we eventually took all our baggage out. I had some beers that were in the front of me. I tell you, they didn't last long. <laughs> anyway. And, um, yeah, when the sun came up, we had landed on the world's biggest runway. It was a huge area specially prepared for us. We hit the ground at 20 to 2 in the morning of the 13th of July and it was probably about half past 2 by the time we'd settled down. At about quarter to 6 it started to get a little bit lighter and uh, we went to go and have a look at what had happened. We couldn't believe it. The amount of debris lying all over the show was, was unbelievable. You know, the aeroplane itself looked fairly intact, but you know, half of it was lying on the, on, on the, the makeshift, makeshift runway. I think that's the shortest landing I've ever done in a shack. It was about 120 meters. A normal landing is probably about 1,000 meters, at least. And seeing the aircraft as daylight approached and as became lighter during the morning, um, yes, it was heartbreaking to see the aircraft um, so, so, so damaged as, as, she, as she lay there. It was absolute chaos. The wheel bogies had been dislodged out of the, out of the wheel wells. It was... It was chaos, to say the least. Um, John Balladin is a, a survival instructor, so what we did was, was we got the people within our crew who were the experts and we appointed them to run the next phase. And the only injury sustained, a piece of debris hit Potty on the head in the brain and it bled profusely, but it was actually very minor. But all other injuries sustained, sprained ankles, twisted knees, 
all happened getting out of that thing. We, we started planning. Yeah, we reckoned that in that heat we could probably last about 24 hours uh, before we really had any, anything serious to, to contend with. When we uh, were sending out our Mayday uh, transmission 1215, we were heard by a Lufthansa 502, it was the call sign of the aircraft. It was an A300, uh, and uh, we relayed to them that we were in this dire strait situation. And they radioed Dakar in Senegal, which is the rescue coordination center for West Africa, who then in turn got hold of Bodo in Norway and the rescue coordination center in the UK and told them what the Lufthansa 502 had conveyed to them. Then, at about maybe quarter past, half past seven, but the guy said, good, here's it. Here's an aeroplane. He said, no. And we looked, and there in the distance I could see an Atlantique going. So we decided, oh, we've got to do something now. So we started putting out things, you know, messages. We took flying overalls and made, you know, one nine OK. Um, we got our flares ready. We threw uh, some fuel over the um, wheel bogey and lit it up so that there was a smoke, something for them to aim for and a constant reminder as to where we were. And we established communications with the aircraft on 1215. But one of the techniques, when an aircraft turns away from you, you switch off the pelvic beacon, then he realizes, oh, he's turning the wrong way. He immediately turned, the aircraft turned again towards us and we switched the beacon on again. Then he knew he was doing the right thing. As soon as he had done that, the aircraft then turned and headed for our direction. And it was uh, like manna from heaven. I can't believe it. And he'd been flying for about three hours to get to us, because he came from Dakar. So it just goes to show, you know, obviously the minute that they heard that we were down, they scrambled these guys, got them airborne, and sent them to us. And at one stage, uh, she also dropped us a survival canister. Uh, I'd never run so fast in my life that morning, um, racing down to collect this canister. There was uh, water supplies, uh, the basic, uh, basic um, emergency rations. Then the beers really started to pop, you know, because then we realized we weren't going to be in a survival mode at all now. We would be purely a rescue mode now. And they came upon two Nissan Safari vehicles belonging to the United Nations. They um, threw a bottle with a message uh, in front of, this, of these two patrolling vehicles. Vehicle stopped, opened up the, opened up the bottle, read the message uh, to say, one aircraft has crashed near your position. And it gives a course and a bearing and it says 19 persons on board and they give a frequency in which they will communicate with one another. Well, these fellows arrived there, and they were genuinely United Nations guys. I mean, there was a Russian, there was a French guy, there was an Egyptian, there was a, a Kenyan amongst them. And we were very, very pleased to see them. And the first thing they did, after giving us sort of great big bear hugs, was to actually give us bottles of water. And one of the guys said, it was his fourth day in the desert, and he never saw such a crowd waving at them at the crash site. Because all, all the time when they arrived at crash, airplane crash scenes, all they saw was bodies lying around, bones lying around. And here's 19 South Africans in the orange overalls cheering them with a castle. Derek Page, who was the Chief of the Air Force's uh, representative, he being an ex-diplomat, was given the task of making sure that our interests and our safety and our well-being was uh, taken care of, and this he did fantastically. 
we'd actually sent the initial emergency message followed by the Mayday message whilst we were over Mauritania. But because we turned to the coastline to find cooler air, uh, we had passed some 14 odd kilometers into uh, Western Sahara, which is laid claim to by Morocco. And of course, it's disputed land by the group, the Polisario. So we were effectively had come down in Polisario territory or the disputed area that the Polisario. And this helicopter arrived as well. And um, the chap got out of it, the pilot got out of it in a, in a swagger. And he came and looked at this lot and he sort of made the comment to say, My God, you guys, how did you do this? <laughs> I was lucky to fly out there because I was injured. So myself and Mr. Uh, Major Horace Block, we got a lift on the chopper. And in fact, when the guys boarded the, the vehicles and the aircraft to fly back and to travel back by road to Haza Iguanot, uh, some of the guys would not look back. I mean, that's, that's the next part of the story. And the part of the story is frightening, the first part. But what was to come was equally frightening. I was again called to join the crowd of United Nations folk and was introduced to the Polisario area commander. And he was very pleased that we had been given a second chance to live. And praise to Allah from him and all. It really he seemed to be affected by the concept that we'd walked away from the accident. So much so that he said, well, there must be a feast and that they would slaughter a goat for us for dinner that night. We spent some time afterwards talking to, uh, to the Polisario man uh, through an interpreter uh, about that he wanted to look after us and that he'd been instructed by his government in exile who were in Algeria that we were, to, uh, we were the guests of the Polisario. However, the force commander did say to us that there would always be a United Nations man with us. And so Commander Dryden followed us uh, all the way through to Algeria to Tendouf, which was the next stop. And the next morning we waited for the Antonov 26 to arrive and it offloaded the rations and then we got airborne with it, the Antonov 26 that would fly us then through to Tendouf in the southwest corner of Algeria. The Russian pilots flew over it a couple of times to have a look at it and again very clearly in the aircraft some looked and some didn't look. Moving on we, uh, we arrived at Tendouf um, and really very well treated. We were met by the governor. No, he explained to us that we would then uh, be going to the Polisario uh, camp. We were effectively taken to a place uh, where we were given the, the dress to wear, the, the local dress, and we were, had the opportunity to have a shower and we were given some food. They, they really looked after us. And, I and after the dinner, we were then taken to where the actual, their VIP quarters were. And we were put up there for the night. waiting for diplomacy between South Africa and Morocco and South Africa and the Polisario. It started to work on the nerves of the weaker among us. So what we did was the strong of us got the weak together and we started to talk to them, talk about things, get their minds right, get their faces straight, get everything organized. One sort of motivated the guys to say, look, we're not going to be like ostriches and stick our heads in the sand but that we are in fact going to be proud enough to rebuild another Shackleton. I had for the first time made contact with South Africa and in fact they went to fetch the Chief of the Air Force out of the pub and he had a few words of encouragement to us and, and said that uh, we must expect the Boeing, our Boeing 707 to come and fetch us and that we must just be strong. But you know so by then we don't know uh, drinks at all because they don't drink and they don't 
like you to drink and they don't like drink at all. So we didn't drink. Most of the guys had no more cigarettes. So, you know, they were in tatty state of affairs. <laughs> and eventually the aeroplane did arrive. Took us to Dindif and we got into a C1 Algerian Air Force C-130 and he flew us to Algeria. And I think there we were all traditionally, like you see all these little kids standing with their noses squashed up against the window. Yeah, we all stood with our noses pressed up the window to see uh, a SAF aeroplane. And at about half past ten, SAF Boeing 707 touched down. And shit, what a great sight. There were handshakes, there were the hugs, the bear hugs from their side as well and that. Once we boarded the aircraft and we saw faces we recognised, the crew we recognised, guys from it. And the most important thing it was ice cold castle beers. <laughs> but uh, it was home comforts again. We were back home aboard our airplane. I think there was a lot of jubilation in that. Sort of the guys were very happy and very animated, very talkative. Suddenly there was lots of talking. And I think it was just that that release that was there. We had lots to eat. I mean, they brought biltong for us and all those good things that we did. It was good, but I, as an individual, I felt very low. I was very angry that we had worked so, so hard and we had disappointed so many people. It was, it was not our fault. It was just fate. I remember my mum saying to me, do you know how honoured you are to have witnessed and survived what you have, what you've had? I said, thanks mum, it's an honour I don't want. I'd rather have the aeroplane and everyone intact and a successful mission there and back. I remember saying to Ian de Voss when I was on the Good Morning South Africa programme that uh, the aircraft will definitely come back to South Africa. Well, I'm sorry. From the ashes of Pelican 1-6 came Pelican 2-2, her maiden post-restoration flight made on the 18th of February 1995. Commemorating the 8th anniversary of the crash of Pelican 16, the crew gathers in Cape Town to remember the event that changed their lives. Hello, Kwarty. I had you from the morning Paul. Where? I got one of our Pelle to bring, Ron. I think this is how the plane looks now. This is the engine, one of the engines. And this is the flag that those Polisario people put up. Yeah. There's, just so much, there's just so much going through me on a night like tonight. And I just, I just think we are hugely, hugely lucky to be pals together tonight. And I'm desperately, desperately grateful to be with you guys. That was, it was a very interesting evening that I remember extremely well for some other reason. The cup is on the right hand side. Great. Remember that, Chris? Great. Mm -hmm. And then he said, Boys, you'll be the big and bit. Now, when Peter says that, you can say that. <laughs> And those are his mind cold, and now the camera at the time, and Chris said, boys, and I can't ask cock. What up, Eric? I got in there, and, I, and uh, Eric was just concentrating on flying. I mean, he, he'd already given the instructions, everything was being done, and I was now shouting in the odds about, give me an engine here, and give me an, 
take that engine away. And, and you know, we're all talking, but you know, the guy that was just had it all under control was old Eric. Yeah. And he was just so... <laughs> Eric is a man of yeah. few words. Yeah. <laughs> he just he just handled the whole thing. I mean, he's just such a perfect, perfect aviator. Yeah. And we're hugely lucky. Uh, Eric, you, you've got to hear it. I must say, the guys that were in the front of that aeroplane that night were the best qualified, and did the best job that anybody could ever have done. Mm. If it wasn't for them, none of us would have been here tonight. Mm. There's yeah. no question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>